thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon. I hope you are having a good time at, at the conference. And uh, well, I, what I have prepared for you is uh, hexagonal architecture and modular monolith decomposition. I made sure to put the word modular because there is a lot of, uh, not buzz, but there are a lot of baggage uh, related with the word monolith decomposition. It's pattern attribute, especially attributed to patterns like uh, branch by abstraction, strangle fig. And I want to make sure that this is not what is covering here. Uh, what is being covered here is a, um, it's a intra microservice decomposition where we have a big, a big monolith full of classes and we slowly decompose using ideas from hexagonal architecture inside a microservice. It's not, uh, you know, it's not a system high level architecture, it's more close to the code intra service. And, uh, yeah, my name is John Wheeler. I'm a software engineer at Tokado Technology. And now uh, well, I have a bachelor's degree. You can find me on the social networks. I'm trying to put, because uh, this is a lot of content, and uh, well, I do my best to transmit you with, uh, you're going to see that the presentation is quite visual. Uh, it's very doodly, how, they, how someone told me, full of drawings. Uh, but I'm trying to put it in a more um, comprehensive uh, and long form article. So if, if you follow me on Medium, uh, you're going to get tuned to, to that and, and, and no more. Uh, there is a lot of content on the internet about the Sagan architecture, but particularly this view, the way I understand, I haven't seen much. So I think there is value into it. And uh, hopefully that is. So uh, first, I would like uh, some comments about the color technology. Um, this Okada Technology was born in the, the company Okado is very famous in UK for the supermarket uh, chain, and uh, we are one of the first which started in the online grocery market. So we order online and we deliver to your home. We started this business in the year 2000, where it was pretty rough to do this for a variety of reasons, economically speaking. But after undercoming a lot of challenges and uh, getting the technology better and better, uh, especially w what you see in the video is uh, these are customer fulfillment centers, so-called CFCs. Uh, I did particularly didn't know there was such a thing uh, in existence until I entered Ocado. So these are very large grids with thousands of robots that are moving groceries around. They, Massive fleet coordinated by uh, the so-called control towers. And uh, you order your food from the e-commerce that we provide, and then the order gets into the customer fulfillment centers. Magic happens with robots picking the food, and eventually this is delivered to your home. So this whole ecosystem of e-commerce, CFCs, and logistics is what we call Okado Smart Platform. And we are currently selling for big supermarket chains all, all over the world. And this is getting more and more, especially after the pandemic. Uh, there was a huge increase. So it's an interesting uh, business full of challenges. I, I personally recommend if you, if you want to check, check more about our company, you can follow this QR code. There will be another one at the end. We have uh, an office in Barcelona. And then, yeah, feel free to check it out. Just a few words about the company. Uh, this uh, decomposition, this is based on a real, real use case scenario that was done inside the payments team in Ocado, where there was a point with, uh, we had a big monolith and we have like 20 engineers, and uh, there was a point where it was really hard to, to, to keep up with development, to have parallel development. Um, merge conflicts were quite common. And uh, well, a variety of problems that arise when you have a big buff monolith and a large team. You want to be, a, you want to be agile. You, you want to have small teams, but if your code base is shared, uh, it's not that easy to do. So this was uh, the main, uh, the main goal of this decomposition, to try this sort of reversed Conway maneuver to try to reshape the software and, and see what will pop up from there. And uh, so you may see the final goal was to go to microservices, but as is recommended by the market, a good strategy, because 
if you get a, a microservice transition, a, a monolith to a microservice transition, if you get it wrong, it's generally very hard to go back. Or, or also it's very hard to really realize how wrong it's going, because you have this distributed transaction, it's harder to profile, harder to, to visualize uh, the, whole, uh, the whole mesh. So going from monolith to modular monolith is generally recommended. For example, one good author that wrote the microservice book, Sam Newman, he recommends doing this middle step, this is a middle step. And of course, there are different ways that you can uh, decompose a monolith, different uh, techniques. We leverage Hexagon now with uh, driven by use case semantics uh, because it, it felt really, really a, a suitable approach for uh, a number of reasons. So how I'm going to try to to split this presentation into three stages for to transmit you sort of crystallizes how this uh, decomposition was in place. First, we we're gonna do a brief look at payments monolithic style. How is the application structure? Then we go to using hexagon architecture concepts, the ports and adapter. How we apply the perspective on this? And by the end, that is a, a very doodly analogy that uh, I I. I was talking to a friend, and we want an analogy just to, because these concepts sometimes are a bit hard to really grasp it. And uh, there is an analogy at the end that I hope that we will help on that. So yeah, let's get it started. But first, I would like to ask who is familiar, knows about hexagon architecture, at least have read about. A few, not that many people, but uh, let's. So yeah, I I don't really I won't go deep into hexagonal because that would really take much more time. Uh, so let's see. I hope that you guys follow with me. Uh, sorry, I should have. This is not right. <laughs> okay, this is that was wrong. Uh, the way the application is uh, structured, basically speaking, is a common way to develop applications. Is what we call a layer architecture. Uh, see if, if you can identify uh, with your own applications nowadays. Normally, you have a controller. In this case, payment controller, and then a request comes. It goes to a service layer called payment service class. And then by the end, the infrastructure, it saves uh, something on the database, retrieves, select. So basically, a, a basic three-layer architecture where most of the business logic is uh, spread across the service layer. Normally, this is accompanied of um, um, anemic models, which means objects with just getters and setters. And the business rule is really into the service classes. So it's uh, not really following object-oriented principles. Martin Fowler called this style uh, transactional script style. I, I'm calling, but this is really not in the literature. But when I see a bunch of service classes that are, that are interacting with other classes without abstractions, without using interface. So you have all of this coupling around. And you are especially leveraging a lot of CDI, context and dependence injection, for things like a Spring Framework. I am calling it service-based development, because it's one way I see, but don't, don't take this uh, like it's not on the literature. But what I refer to sort of service-based development is uh, you have this bunch of classes. All the business rule is spread into, into these classes, not following object-oriented. And uh, it's a component of layer architecture. So you don't, have, you, you don't have abstractions in between. You don't use interfaces, right? If you want to switch infrastructure, that's, go that's going to be hard. There will be a lot of uh, coupling into your software. Uh, I'm calling it service-based development. And all, an application built only using service classes is a flat mesh of unstructured data and logic. This order prevails. In a system like this, if you want to develop a feature, a use case, that will touch, normally it will touch a multiple of service classes, that's going to be a hell. That you're going to have much conflicts, it's going to be hard to understand, uh, hard to follow. Uh, a variety of different perspectives of problems will arise. Uh, mainly one, with this, when the software grows, you will achieve a high cognitive load 
the onboarding of, of a new member will be, will be hard. You, you have high cup limit in services. Development is not gonna, you, you're not gonna be able to keep, keep up. Uh, especially testing is also very hard. And uh, in our case, in the payment system, we really, we, we had a very complex scenario because infrastructure was very dynamic. We needed to integrate with very different uh, payment service providers. And uh, there was different requirements. The software is deployed in a multi-cloud environment with different regions in AWS. Different retailers have different configurations. So we leverage a lot of feature flags. So the infrastructure part was really iffy. You, you, will, you will find loads of if in the source code, or if this customer in this environment, then select this sort of um, uh, database tables, like this sort of infrastructure perspective. For one client, publish on Q1. For another client, uh, publish on Q2, for example. And uh, so this style of high coupling was really getting into our toes. And the Zagona architecture felt interesting for the problem. But uh, let's focus on the decomposition where we, we want to, to get from this mesh of classes and we want to modularize our microservices. We want to modularize our software. This will help us achieving uh, well-defined boundaries. You're going to be able to, to, to see, the, OK, which part of the domain is the module one treating, which part of the domain is the second module treating. We're going to be able to visualize and to really make sense, like, is this decoupling reflecting what we want. Does this make sense? If it makes sense, then we go to microservice. Because getting a module and deploying as a microservice is straightforward if you are following the idea that each module communicates with the other module only via well-defined uh, APIs. So that was our intention. That was uh, uh, the goal. And um, this leads to the second part. Uh, uh, how we decouple this using this concept? Well, um, first a brief, a brief introduction about the Zagona architecture. This very nice guy, uh, you probably have heard of him, I hope so. If not, it's nice to check. His name is Dr. Alistair Cockburn. And he published about the Zagona architecture in the year 2005. But this really comes from pain that he had in projects from before the year 2000. He, he mentions in a, in a talk that the, like, the last point where I need to come up with something was he was in a project and uh, the software was communicating with the database via a library, sort of a hibernate, let's say. But this library was maintaining in-house, in the company housework. And uh, there was a moment where there was a bug in this library, and the team taking care of the database and the library told all the developers, look, you need to stop working for two weeks, then we can fix the library, and you can start working again. And then Alistair was like, well, but can't I just mock the database? Remember, this was like 1990 something. Can't I just mock the database? And, and you know, then when you fix, I just plug your, your library, your database. I, I, I'm just developing my business rule. I have nothing to do with the database. And now the project is still uh, initial development phase. And everyone laughed at the hint and said, no, there is no way. So then he started thinking about it, and then he came with a Zagon architecture. The main goal of this, uh, the original in goal of a Zagon architecture is to be able to test your application, to do a unit test, the same way that the application is running on, on a production context, on a production environment. I want my business rule, my core domain, to behave the same way in a unit test context, the same way as it was running in production. And the, the, the mind shift from the, the layer architecture to the hexagon architecture is that in the layer architecture, you, see, you really see the application as a stacked layer. Right? As, as shown before, you see the entry point layer, the controllers, the middle, and the bottom. Everything moves towards the bottom. The controller has a dependence on the service class. The service class has a dependence on the DAO class, on the repository, on the, on the infrastructure class. Top to bottom. Here is a fairly different uh, mindset, a fairly different way of seeing your application. 
here is not a stacked, is not a, a, a stack anymore. The dependence goes from outside to the inside, so you really see your application as just two layers. But we don't really call it layer, but you see it as a two layers, the outside layer and the inside layer. Uh, I have drawn as a circle, uh, the name is not important, the official name of the pattern is ports and adapters, but it's mostly known as hexagon architecture. The chosen of a hexagon was because uh, it was sort of symmetrical and uh, Alistair liked, but there is no relation to the pattern. And in the inside we place what matters. The inside we, we place our, our job, what we are working for, the business rule, what we do different. And the outside we place everything that is needed to run it. All the, all the adapters, how is it called. And the key point is that the inside doesn't need to know anything about the, the outside. The outside can know about the inside, but the inside is agnostic to everything. So if tomorrow we move from AWS to Google Cloud, at least from this perspective, it should be invisible. There will be problems, but from this perspective, it should be invisible. Infrastructure is replaceable. Replaceable and also, if you have multiple databases or, or multiple REST clients, you can run them all at the same time in runtime, because there will be multiple available implementations of that adapter. Uh, so the, the way to achieve this segregation from the inside to the outside is really these two key things. You have the ports and you have the adapters. These funny little things here are the ports and the gray boxes are the adapters. The way it works is that in, uh, ports are just interfaces. Ports are normal Java interface or whatever mechanism your language has for doing an interface. And the inside the domain will implement these interfaces, and the adapters will implement these other, this, uh, you have the driver ports and the driven ports. Uh, I put the blue one as the driver and the, the red one as the driven. As there is some sort of uh, asymmetrical into that, in the sense that these, uh, the adapters that are driving, so a controller, a controller will call an entry point, will call a port that is implemented by the domain. And the domain will call a port that is implemented by a driven adapters. So everything is related to uh, talking to interface. It really goes into the idea of program to interface and don't program to classes. So if I could try to summarize hexagonal architecture, I would say there is a thin layer of interfaces ar around the domain core. A thing, a shell of interfaces that I have adapters using and adapters implementing it. And uh, what you place in the inside of the hexagon, how you structure the core of your application, that is not concerning hexagonal. The reason why I put this slide is because I have seen in, in there is a lot of misconception attributed to hexagonal people. People uh, normally associate hexagonal architecture first with domain-driven design. Because, okay, you normally, I think it's common to do domain-driven design applications using hexagonal, but there is really no relation uh, between them. Uh, domain-driven design would fall into the inside of the hexagon, right? So both things uh, live together, uh, live together. And I think there is a lot of uh, misconception. People think it's a complex architecture, but it's really not. It's just a thin layer of interfaces. And uh, so you can use multiple styles in the core. You can use domain of actors, who is familiar with the actor model. You can use the service layer base, which is our style of the monolith, the one you should probably not use. You can use function, you can use domain driven design. The, w the one we chose, is uh, use cases and domain model. So it's a layer of use cases and a layer of domain model. There is a similarity with the clean architecture from Uncle Bob in this sort of uh, similar uh, in the sense of use cases. But uh, yeah, so, uh, so this is the style we chose to fix the problem of classes not following uh, good uh, object oriented uh, patterns, principles. And, uh, but just to mention that this is not really mandatory. 
and to try to crystallize better the concept of hexagonal architecture. Okay, I hope this was clear so far. Let's try to look at the, the example, one, one simple example, decomposing it. Uh, let's put three classes into this concept, a payment service class, a payment authentication service class, and a payment DAO. How it looks in the code, simple. Of course, the class is way more complicated, but we need to pay attention on the relation, just the relation. So, uh, ser authentication service has another dependence, and DAO has another dependence. First thing that happens when create payments called is uh, it's going to talk to the DAO, and then it's going to talk to the other service. We this is a different representation. First, a request comes in the controller. Second, calls this, the create payment method. Then it goes to the DAO. Then it calls another method, authenticate. What we would like is to have the payment service class decoupled from the payment authentication class. Remember, we, ha we have one big legacy module there, and we want to break our software apart. So we want classes to belong to different modules and classes to belong to different responsibility. So let's assume, then we, after discussion, that payment authentication does not belong to the same thing as creating a payment. So we're going to try to put this in a different module following ideas of Hexagora. What we do first is, first thing we create like a, a new module, that could be a Java package, it's really not relevant. In our case, it's just Java package. And you select, you select the method create payment from the class uh, payment service, and you place inside that package that you call domain. And then you create this thin layer of interface without any, without any implementation. Uh, following test-driven design, you would uh, potentially use mocks at this point, right? And uh, you're gonna call it create payment port to enter in the domain, save payment port to save the payment. And this is the, the interesting thing. What was one directly call from one class to another? It was just one method call. Now we're gonna, we're gonna add a level of indirection between this call. We're gonna create an interface called authenticate payment port with one method authenticate payment. So we create this these three new interfaces. And the places that create payment was calling the method directly from the other class, now it's gonna call the interface, right? It's gonna call the interface. So it's another level, if, if in, uh, it's, it's one level of indirection. How we implement that interface? Then that, that's gonna be, you, we can have multiple ways of implementing this authenticate. But before it was just one method call. Uh, and then, after, okay, we, we have tested a bit, we have mocked, we, the moment we need to uh, plug these adapters. So in the case of payment DAO, as it was just a class calling a database, uh, in this case just executing a, a insert into the database, we're gonna say payment DAO implements a safe payment port. Not gonna change anything as before. It was just a directly method call, now it's a class implementing an interface, and it's calling that interface instead. A bit more interesting is the authentication adapter because the authentication adapter does not do anything real. What it does is what I call a bridge adapter. It's only useful in the decomposition process. It's not an adapter that is going to the database. No, it's an adapter that you can implement as a lambda. The implementation of the, this interface, authenticate payment port, it's a functional interface in that sense that it's just one method. You implement it just calling the authentication service, authentication v1, that was the method being called directly. So it seems really uh, like you may say, okay, this doesn't really do much because before I was calling authentication v1 directly to the, uh, to the other class, and now I'm calling an interface that is implemented as a method call to that. But the powerful thing is that, is that by creating this layer of interfaces around and having these bridge adapters that are going to your own software, they are not going to, to other uh, infrastructure, other microservices, they are, they, are, they are your own classes, 
by doing this crystallization of this boundary, it's really visible what you, what you say that is the payment module and what is the rest. This is the, the divisor. Um, there, are, there are a number of uh, ways of seeing it and benefits. We cannot go over all of them. But the, this bridge, just calling payment authentication service, which we call for now legacy module, because we, we just extracted the payment module. But later, at a later point, we can introduce a authentication module if we deem uh, reasonable, right? So the, yeah, you're going to have feedback from how you are doing your design. I hope this was clear. We are reaching the end. Uh, I don't have time to mention, but this, uh, in this migration, we encounter different scenarios. So I want to mention before that there is a variety of, of uh, customers and variety of infrastructure that we select, and we do heavily use of feature flag. Who here uses feature flag or toggable feature? One, oh, a lot of people. OK, so this may be, may be interesting if you have a software that is full of if conditions. If feature flag ABC, do something else, do another thing. So we found we have many of these situations. And we found this pattern interesting because it gives, it gives an idea of strategy design pattern sort of a strategy applied to infrastructure. The example we have seen, there was no feature flag. So it's what I call the first, the first example here. Uh, the laser, probably don't see much the laser pointer. But this first um, decomposition pattern, which is a simple public function with no feature flag points, it simply becomes a use case class with a number of adapters. I didn't name use case before. I didn't want to get too, too much baggage. But the adapt, so the use case would be the payment service extracted, the method create payment. It, it would become create payment use case. And the save payment port implementation, the save payment adapter, would be one adapter. The authentication adapter would be another one. This is the simple case. But it gets really interesting. And, and the powerful of applying Exago now with this control flow with feature flags is when you have feature flag points, then you select different adapters. So the if and else condition, each part becomes one different adapter. So the if true, what is inside becomes one adapter. The else becomes another adapter. And when you are creating the use case, you select which adapters to wire in your code. So you can really have a variety of combinations, and it's really expressive. You can add or remove adapters much simpler than removing clo if clauses in your code. It's, uh, it's really strategy pattern applied to infrastructure. And this can grow. If you, can, you can have the third case, which we, we had the third case in a, in a funny decomposition uh, use case. Uh, where the function was so big, there was checking feature flag at such a high level point that instead of just delegating to new adapters, just extracting to adapter, we actually created two different use cases. The function was doing too many things at such a high level that it, it, it became two different use cases with a pool of adapters to choose from. So the feature flag point would select the uh, the, the right use case. And it gets, we didn't have this case, but it could happen, where you have such a nested and, and such a complicated flow of feature flags that you made a couple to different use cases with different adapter selection. So first use case can use one of these two adapters, or could be more as well. And the second use case could also select this one. So you can really configure your software with very different needs. Uh, it's really expressive, really powerful, and uh, yeah, uh, maybe you can also apply to your day today. This was what I had for you for the, the decomposition part. Now there is the, the analogy, which if so far it was not really clear, I hope that this analogy will bring more uh, 
clarity to it. There, is, there are a couple of terms here which I didn't present because that would put me in trouble. But yeah, let's see if we can follow that. So it's a simple conversation of two, two people, Ana and Miguel. The situation is that Ana wants to say good morning to Miguel in his language, okay? Ana knows how to speak Spanish, she knows Portuguese, and she knows English. So she asks, Miguel, do you speak Spanish? And he says, si, yes. And then she says, buenos dias, good morning. How this simple conversation of two people would translate to this mentality of use cases? Well, first, Ana speaks Spanish, Portuguese, and English. So she knows how to speak three languages. And we consider this infrastructure. We consider that the ability of speaking English, we consider English speak adapter, a class that knows how to speak in English. The Portuguese, the same, Portuguese speak adapter. And the third, Spanish speak adapter. So our software has three capabilities of speaking, three different languages. Then there are other adapters that are not fully relevant for the example, but controllers, feature flag adapters, these are also created. But the important ones here are the languages that Anna can speak, that we translate as infrastructure capabilities. Okay, so our software can do all three languages. Then the stimulus, the request comes in. It's, let's try to, to say that the intention of Anna of saying good morning is an endpoint. Right? So it's the greet endpoint, slash greet. So request comes, slash greet, and then there will be a request to the use case factory. This component I didn't mention, but there is a factory for selecting use cases, which we call greeting use case factory. The greeting use case factory, upon the request of doing a greet, it will talk to a component feature flag, which language feature flag, which language should I use in this request. This component knows that, okay, I'm speaking to, to Miguel, so I should give the Spanish speak adapter. The Spanish speak adapter, by being an adapter, is implementing the port, speak port, which is an interface. The, then the greeting use case factory will return the use case. The use case will be executed. And then the, the final outcome is buenos dias to Miguel microservice. So we model here Miguel as a different microservice. The communication buenos dias is a request of some sort. And all the wiring is uh, the which language feature flag decides which language. And the, the way to decouple the good morning from the language is a speak port. If tomorrow I need to add the German language, I wouldn't change anything inside this domain box, anything. The, I would just add a German speak adapter implementing that interface, and that would greet uh, willkommen, I think. Uh, so yeah, I hope that this crystallizes a bit the, the example. The terms here, the, the driver, driver adapters, they reveal the intention of saying good morning. This is what we consider the driver adapter. One example is the greeting controller. The driven adapters, they are the languages. Anna knows how to speak, so I have three driven adapters. The use case class. This is really uh, how to greet, you know, not the language, but the wiring, the, the say good morning, this, the, the intention, how I, how I spell it, this is uh, the use case. The adapters factory, as mentioned, they, they do all the wiring. The ports, the interesting one, the ports, the way I visualize is like inside Anna's brain, 
there is one part of one's brain which knows how to say good morning, and the other part of the brain which knows the language. And the port is the decoupling between these parts. It's what, is, uh, what allows the connection from one to another. So it's really this decoupling uh, from, from what to how. The, uh, the use case factor, so I just mistake it. The adapter, <laughs> the use case factor in the end, this is the one who do, who do all, the, all the wiring. The adapter's factory, the fourth point, is uh, responsible for instantiating the infrastructure classes. So how to boot up, how to create the object, uh, English speaker, Spanish and Portuguese adapter, how to do new there, create the Bing, this is the infrastructure adapter. And uh, that was it. Oh, uh, questions? <laughs>